starting like one more minute i'm gonna let see if anybody else comes in if not um i got a great presentation put forth so we'll get started uh really soon here i see there's a couple more people coming in so All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get things set up, and uh, I'm going to start the, the recording really soon here, too. Uh, let's see here. Um, let me turn this off real quick. All right, now, what's up, what's up, everyone? Let's see you. Mm. Over here, shut this down. All right, cool. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the second uh, Underground Scholars Santa Barbara Writing Workshop. Um, today, I have a couple things in store. And, uh, and like I said, last week, uh, um, we sent out the curriculum by Tay to everyone. Um, I see there's uh, some new people on here. So if you don't have a curriculum by Tay, I'll open up the chat in a little bit. And, uh, and I'll go over uh some things uh and if you have any questions and stuff like that um first thing i'm gonna do today is i'm gonna uh share something that i wrote in the reclaiming our stories book and it actually got turned into a video and uh you know this is a writing workshop and this is the type of writing that we're gonna all be doing is is, is creative writing uh academic research writing academic uh writing in our classes so uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna showcase this video that I did over the summer and uh, they edited it and it came out pretty cool. So check it out, Let's see ya. All right, let me see. All right, here we go. <laughs> Pre 
prison traumatic stress disorder. After serving my time in the segregated housing unit, one day he cuffed me up and said I was going back to the main line. They transferred me to a level four maximum security prison called Salinas Valley, better known as the Death Octagon, as so many inmates die or are killed there. I learned quickly, this is a vicious place. The first yard I go to, I see a homie get his neck split with the shank. Yard recall. They leave us on lockdown for a couple of months, then it would happen again. Another stabbing, another long lockdown. This is how my time in Salinas Valley went. Then we started programming, going to yard and going to school. And out of nowhere, a vicious prison riding run of Southsiders against the Nortenos. They rushed us with a bunch of homemade knives, but we outnumbered them by 25 and we savagely protected ourselves. This was my first experience with a prison riot. They are the bloodiest barbarian events. Very hard to explain to a person who has never been through it. Right after this, I was then transferred to New Folsom. Two months later, I got in my next second chance. I was out at yard walking around with the homie around the track. I'll never forget this moment. A bird took a shit on his shirt. I started clowning him. Ha ha, S.A., you got shitted on by a bird. We continued to walk around the track to a water fountain so the homie could wash his shirt, not knowing that a bloody riot, one of the most gruesome ones in New Folsom State Prison's history, was about to erupt. I remember it got very quiet. The homie looked up at me and said, is it me, or did it just get super quiet? I looked over to see a couple of our homies digging up our stash of homemade butcher knives. I then seen all the homies gathered at the top of the hill in our property. I told the homie, let's get to our property, something's up. We get up there and the homie hands me a huge butcher knife, looks me in the eyes and says, we're rushing the Bay Area Blacks. And within the blink of an eye, we were like army ants rushing at full speed. Why are we fighting? We're both oppressed. Why are we fighting against each other, falling into the hands of what this system wants? As the Bay Area Blacks came running towards us, I started to stab and stick a guy, and it all became a blur. I was screaming, Sutrese, at the top of my lungs as I stabbed a guy who fell to the ground, and I heard, Shh, as concrete chunks hit me in my face. I repositioned myself, and I continued to stab the guy on the floor. I was in an unconscious state of mind full of warrior adrenaline that I didn't know existed in me. And again, boom, concrete chunks hit me in my face. I saw a prison officer zeroing in on me with a mini 14 semi-automatic rifle pointed at my head. I then realized he was trying to kill me. I instantly stopped to take off, running up a hill to see a group of my homies getting three Bay Areas. We were then shot at again. By the time this battle ended, it had gone on for 10 minutes. When I sat down and came back to my mind, I seen bloody bodies laying everywhere. As I watched them escort lifeless bodies off the yard and I looked around to see all my homies on top of the hill in the Bay Area's property, it dawned on me. I almost got shot in the head twice. We sat there for hours as helicopters flew around in the air. It was all over the news. We were on lockdown for almost two years after this riot. Why are we fighting? Why aren't we together as one? We need to come together as one. We need to quit falling into these traps that are put in place by the system to divide and conquer us all. It's time to unite and come together. Black power, brown pride, and realize that as long as we're divided, we're conquered. Until the day that we are together as one, we will not be able to abolish the system that's in place. So it's time to grab hands together as one, as one force, and fight off this brutal state of oppression that this disgusting capitalist system has brought into our lives in mass incarceration. How is this rehabilitating us? Look at all this killing, all these riots, all these stabbings. Stop killing each other.
each other. It's time to come together as one. It's time to be one force against this oppressive state they call the Department of Corruption. So yeah, that was uh one of uh the little things that we that uh we did over the summer and it was actually a really cool project uh with the Odyssey uh project right here at UCSB. They went in to uh uh I, I wanna say it was like a juvenile correctional facility that is actually housing um uh, uh juvenile uh uh girls and worked with them on creating uh some sort of it was like a, 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 a dialogue type movie thing and also using video videography and taught them how to edit videos and stuff like that. It was pretty cool. But that was the video that I did and then they mixed up everything and uh, put it all together. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share uh, the PowerPoint for today. Today we're gonna be talking about the uses of research, public and private. Um, in this uh, workshop, we're going to define research, then discuss how you benefit from learning to do it well, while, why we value it, and why we hope you will too. Um, like I said in my last, uh, my last presentation, um, which there was a lot more people, but I haven't really been advertising this whatsoever. I've just kind of let people know that it exists and they want to join us, they can join us. If not, that's cool too. Uh, it'll be recorded and used for, you know, little things later uh, with uh, formerly incarcerated students. Um, so pretty much uh, research um, is what we do here at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And I've been learning this research process um, throughout uh, the summer with McNair Scholars. Um, what I'm about to regurgitate to you all today um, is uh, something that I learned in my methods class that was taught by John Ferran. And he gave us this book called The Craft of Research. And The Craft of Research was a really deep book. Um, I'll send this book out to everyone. As soon as I open up the chat in a little bit, if you want this book, this book is pretty much what I'm citing from today and I'm taking it and I'm giving it back to you guys because this book totally uplifted my mind. And, uh, and I know that, uh, it, you know, speaking about it is going to enhance your mind to understand research and, and how, how, how to conduct research and the research writing process. Thinking in print. Whenever we read about a scientific breakthrough, or a crisis in world affairs, we benefit from the research of those who report it, who in return benefited from the research of countless others. When we talk into a library, we are surrounded by more than 25 centuries of research. When we go on the internet, we can read millions of reports written by researchers who have posed questions beyond number gathered untold amounts of information from the research of others to answer them, then shared their answers with the rest of us so that we can carry on their work by asking new questions, and we hope answering them. Teachers at all levels devote their lives to research. Governments spend billions of dollars on it. Businesses even more. Research goes on in laboratories and libraries in jungles and ocean depths, in caves and in outer space, in offices and in the information age, even in our own homes. Research is in fact the world's biggest industry. Those who cannot do well or evaluate that of others will find themselves sidelined in a world increasingly dependent on sound ideas based on good information 
produced by trustworthy inquiry and then presented clearly and accurately without trustworthy published research, we all would be locked in the opinions of the moment, prisoners of what we alone experience are dupes to whatever we're told. Of course, we want to believe that our opinions are sound, yet mistaken ideas, even dangerous ones, flourish because too many people accept too many opinions based on too little evidence. And as recent events have shown, those who act on unreliable evidence can lead us, indeed have led us, into disaster. That's why in this workshop, we will urge you to be amiably skeptical of the research that you read, to question it, even as you realize how much you depend on it. I start off with this right here because it's so true. This whole entire world is all about research and, and, it's, and we've developed so much research. I think the best part of this right here is to talk about how libraries have so much research uh, in them and so, so many people's theories. But like, I, like what was said at the end, not all of these are factual. Uh, there's a lot of biased research that's out there. So it's important to question everything, to question everything and go out and do your own research and find out if you can validate that research or not. And, you know, and there's still a lot of, there's so much that's unanswered in this world, but, you know, uh, be skeptical on the research that you read is a very uh, 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 huge point to take away from that slide right there. What is research? In the broadest terms, we do research whenever we gather information to answer a question that solves a problem. Problem, where do I find a new head gasket for my 65 Mustang? Research, look in the yellow pages for an auto parts store then call to see if it has one in stock. Problem, to settle a bet, I need to know when Michael Jordan was born. Research, you Google Michael Jordan's birthday. Problem, I'm curious about a new species of fish. Research, you search the internet for articles in newspapers and academic journals. We all do that kind of research every day. And though we rarely write it up, we rely on those who wrote it up theirs. Jordan's biographers, the fish discoverers, the publishers of the yellow pages, and the catalogs of the auto parts suppliers. They all wrote up their research because they knew that one day someone would have a question that they could answer. If you're preparing to do a research project, not because you want to, but because it's been assigned, you might think that it is just make work and treat it as an empty exercise. We hope you won't. Done well, your project prepares you to continue. Join the oldest and most esteemed of human conversations, one conducted for millennia among philosophers, engineers, biologists, social scientists, historians, literary critics, linguists, theologians, not to mention CEOs, lawyers, marketers, investment managers, sociologists. The list is endless. Right now, if you are a beginner, you may feel that the conversation is one-sided, that you have to listen more than you can speak because you have little to contribute. If you are a student, you may feel that you have only one reader, your teacher. All that may be true for the moment, but at some point you will join a conversation that at its best can help you and your community free us from ignorance, prejudice, and the half-baked ideas that so many charlatans try to impose on us. It is no exaggeration to say that maybe not today or tomorrow, but one day the research you do and the arguments you make using it can improve, if not the whole world, then at least your corner of it. That's vital. You know, uh, uh, you're going to be inserting yourself in a bunch of different discussions. Um, if not, you know, you're going to focus and center your research around, uh, you know, pressing issues in our communities and, uh, you're going to, you're going to figure out answers. You know, uh, one thing that 
was quoted to me and I carried close to my heart is those closest to the issues and the problems are the ones closest to the solutions. And uh, I'm very huge on credible messengers. One thing that's, you know, uh, been very slim to none in a lot of this research is researchers who have the lived experience and, and are credible messengers to get their, their knowledge out, their lived experience along with the research that they do. Um, you know, that's changing now, but you know, that's one point I want to point out, especially for a lot of the up and coming formerly incarcerated researchers. Um, your research is, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come up with solutions, a lot of solutions to a lot of the problems that our communities are facing today. Why write it up? Well, I'll tell you right now, my theory on why write it up is because writing is one of the most powerful tools and powerfulest weapons in this world. All this, all this world is written up. It, there, you know, all these countries have constitutions, have all these things that were written up. They were written up. Policies written up. Everything is written up. So we live in a world that's written up. And for some of you, though, the invitation to join this conversation may still seem easy to decline. If you accept it, you'll have to find a good question. Search for sound data, formulate and support a good answer, and then write it all up. Even if you turn out a first rate paper, it may be read not by an eager world, but only by your teacher. And besides, you may think my teacher knows all about it. What do I gain from writing up the research other than proving that I can do it? One answer is that we write not just to share our work, but to improve it before we do. So that ending right there is we write not to just share our work, but to pr improve it before we do. Um, in my, in my writing uh, 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 research throughout the summer, my first written uh, uh, research that I wrote up with all these ideas was so unfocused. It's important to build your writing crew and have your writing crew evaluate your work. So what I did is I wrote this paper up and it was all over the place. It had so many thoughts in it, so many ideas, so many uh, theories and so much that I dug around because when you start to like go and do all this research and you start to read all this work, it starts to take your mind in, in multiple different places and it's hard to focus. And so one thing that I recognized was your first write up is you're gonna you're probably gonna scrap a lot of it but you'll have it there for you know uh forever it'll be there forever in your archive but then you go and you showcase that first write-up with all your ideas and you get your critique your critique from your writing crew so you set up a writing crew it, it, whether it's a mentor whether it's uh uh, uh folks who are in their phd um, whether it's your own friends that, you know, may understand writing, uh, you know, uh, uh, writing standards and may understand things a little differently than you because they've had more uh, teaching and more, uh, more time to and more experience with writing. You wrap yourself with around them and you have them critique your paper, tear it apart, give you all their best advice. Now, if you send it to somebody and they're like, oh, this looks good, and they don't really critique it, you want to run it through at least five more people. Like, you want to surround yourselves with people who are going to break down your work and get you good and get you centered and what you're trying to explain and what type of question you're and, and answers you're trying to, to receive. So get a crew of, like, five, six people and – you shoot out your first one. So I shot out my first one and my first one was all over the place. And I went back in and I revised it all. I took everyone's suggestions on my revision and then I got a, a second piece that was centered, focused, but still all over the place. And I took that one back to my writing crew 
my writing crew broke it down for me, gave me their, their sound advice, their, their suggestions. I revised it again. I did this about 20 times before I got like a structured solid paper that still to this day is not even, you know, uh, uh, like it's not even, I would say close to what's out there and being published, but I went through all the, the hard work of re of revising. So your paper is going to go through multiple stages of revision and don't get upset about it. That's just the way writing is. So, so I, I say that it's important to really have a strong writing crew and then even have people outside of your writing crew that are professors that may have time to go through and look at your paper and really give you a uh, great gra grammatical suggestions, great ideas on the structure of your paper and just continue to build off that paper. Um, so yeah, that's just some of my, some of my uh, own experiences of, of writing research uh, throughout the summer with the McNair Scholars Program here at UC Santa Barbara. Write to remember. One thing that I'll suggest to every college student um, is when you're reading, be writing. Don't just read and not write. You gotta stay writing. It's important to write and to and to uh, take down everything that you're reading and and regurgitate it out on paper. It's super important. Don't let uh, the readings uh, uh, intimidate you because they're dense. There's a lot of big words, but I'm telling you what you're reading went through about a hundred revisions. So they went through and they added big words to it. They went through and totally restructured and revised that work before it got published. So what you're reading can be dense. It can have language that you don't understand. And that's because they went through and they took, they had a thesauruses, they had a dictionary and they were just right there uh, putting words together and piecing them in. And so what you're reading is finished revision work that probably could go through 10 more revisions, but they wanted to get it published. So it's important for experienced researchers first write just to remember what they've read. And I challenge all college students to write what they have read. Write it up. Don't sit there and try to read it all the way to the end while you're reading you should be writing a whole doc on what you're reading and how i've been doing it and what's been helping me in a little suggestion is i've been making an annotated bibliography so i write everything that i'm reading out of this book or out of this uh academic research paper and i write it all down and then i go in and i piece it together into everything that i took from that reading and then i put my citation on the top and I have a whole doc that I've created with an annotated bibliography of everything I've read. So now when I'm going in and I'm writing research in the future, all I do is I go to my annotated bibliography and I just read the two paragraphs or three paragraphs of what I just read and I cite. I'm like, oh, I can cite this. This goes with my writing that I'm doing. I can cite this. This goes with my writing that I'm doing. I can everything that I am actually uh, reading because I was writing and reading at the same time. Don't get caught in trying to read all this stuff and don't get caught not writing on it because I, I guarantee we're all humans and you're not going to remember this stuff. One thing that writing has taught me and, and, and you know, I'm, 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 I've barely been in school doing that. I barely learned how to write with commas and periods when I was 27 years old. So I've barely been doing all this stuff. You know, I barely learned how to do uh, the, the structure of, of paragraphs. So one thing that writing has shown me is everything that I'm processing in my mind. The only way you know what you're taking into your mind is by writing. That's the only way you know what you're learning. So it's important to read and write at the same time so that you can take those concepts and you can have them for future reference 
And also it's important for you to understand what you're, what you're understanding, what you're taking in. And that's the way you're able to analyze your internal growth and your internal understanding of the materials that you're reading right now. So a few talented people can hold in mind masses of information, but most of us get lost when we think about what Smith found in light of Wong's position and compare both to the odd data in Brunelli, especially as they are supported by Boskowitz. But what was it that Smith said? When you don't take notes on what you read, you're likely to forget or worse, misremember it. So yeah, that's you know uh, the, one of the greatest suggestions uh, is to just read and write at the same time. Write to understand. It's hard to understand all these concepts, these theories, everything that we're being thrown in our face, like they're really on some matrix tip at these universities. They're like, they're like throwing all this stuff at you. Boom, boom. It's just hitting you. And you're like, you're like this, you know, sometimes I go at night, I, I, I'm stressed out. Like, you know, it's causing anxiety because I, you're taking in so much information. It's, it's important to write, to understand this information. And if you don't understand it, do some research and read some other people's works to understand it. It's not, it, all it is, is, is not breaking down. Accept all this knowledge that's being thrown at your mind and sit, sift through it. Cause you're grasping stuff that nobody's ever heard or seen. We're in a very privileged space. A lot of folks aren't getting the privilege and don't have the privilege to get these professors and understand uh, what, what's being taught. They don't, they, they, and they may never, they may walk through life and never get to be in this privileged space. So really write to understand this space and everything that you're learning because it's enhancing your mind and helping you grow. But at the same time, it's important for you to understand it so you can take it back to your communities and uplift them because it's not about just learning this stuff. It's about taking it back to our communities and uplifting our communities. We can't leave our communities behind. So yes, we're here in this privileged space, but it's, it's, it, we're here for only a brief moment and we got to take as much as we can suck out of this space and run back to our communities and uplift them and, 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 and hopefully give them the hand up to get over to this space to get the teachings that we just got. So a second reason for writing is to see the larger patterns and what you read. When you arrange and rearrange the results of your research in new ways, you discover new implications connections and complications. Even if you could hold it all in your mind, you would need help to, to line up arguments that pull in different directions, plot out complicated relationships, sort out disagreements among experts. I want to use these claims from Wong, but her argument is undercut by Smith's data. When I put them side by side, I see that Smith ignores this last part of Wong's argument, aha. If I introduce it with this part from Brunelli, I can focus on Wong more clearly. That's why careful researchers never put off writing until they've gathered all the data they need. They write from the start of their projects to help them assemble their information in new ways. And like I was telling you, at the beginning stages of my McNair project, I was trying to write something fast real quick of everything that I was reading and my question I didn't even know what a research question was I was like you know and and uh so I had identified uh what I thought was three waves in the movement against mass incarceration well come to find out mass incarceration didn't like launch out until you know, 1970 era, era 19, 1980 is when we started to see mass incarceration like go. And then we seen a 750% uh, percent increase uh, uh, within uh, the population of those who were incarcerated, you know, so it was like in 19, but, but incarceration started at a very 
earlier time. It started, you know, in England and the UK and Ireland, and, and that's where they started to incarcerate folks. So I went through the history of incarceration and, and I started to recognize that there was three waves. And so I was trying to identify these three waves at the beginning of my McNair research, but it was like a historical thing and I didn't really have a centered question. So I ran it by my mentor. My mentor was like, this is good, but you need to really center yourself. And like, so gave me some suggestions on some academic research that, and I read it and I went with something way different than what I was trying to explain in my first one. So like I said, you're going to stay writing. You're going to write everything down that you're reading it's going to take you down a bunch of different uh, avenues but at the end you'll find your centered research question and your centered solutions and what you're trying to put forth in your arguments right to test your thinking i said this in in in, in the slides before it's important to understand your internal self and the only way you're going to know what you got going on in your internal self is by writing. So I tell everyone, write to understand your thoughts, write to understand and connect your internal thoughts, your internal thinking, your internal comprehension. A third reason to write is to get your thoughts out of your head and onto paper, where you'll see what you really can think. Just about all of us, students and professionals alike, believe our ideas are more compelling in the dark of our minds than they turn out to be in the cold light of print. You can't know how good your ideas are until you separate them from the swift and muddy flow of thought and fix them in an organized form that you and your readers can study. In short, we write to remember more accurately, understand better, and evaluate what we think more objectively. And as you will discover, the more you write, the better you read. So the more you write, the better you read, the better you understand the sentence structure. I was working with uh, 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 an individual from my writing crew because I, I, I have a writing crew that I've been writing with. This individual uh, was showing me how each paragraph is trying to accomplish some, something and broke down how each uh, sentence in every paragraph is, 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 is putting forth this academic researcher's ideas and arguing their points and broke it down for me. So each paragraph is trying to accomplish something uh, in the reader's mind. And that's, that's the structure of writing. So you write for purpose. You want to have purpose in every single one of your paragraphs. And so that was something that I learned this summer with McNair. Like, I didn't know that you had th these three sentences in this paragraph, and then you had, you know, three sentences in this next paragraph and three sentences in this next paragraph that were all leading up and answering your question of what you were trying to get across and argue. And so, so yeah, that was awesome to understand because now when I'm reading this academic research, I'm seeing you know, uh, I'm seeing what they're trying to argue, what they're saying. I'm seeing the, the, the purpose of each paragraph. Now, I'm no, I'm no expert at it, and I still got a lot of learning to do, so I still have to um, uh, read a lot more. Like, I'm in the beginning stages of this academic journey. You know, there's folks that have read so much more stuff uh, than, than all of us that may be right here. And they have a different understanding and a different, they see things differently. But the only reason why they see that is because they've written a little bit more than us and they've read a way whole bunch more than us. And that's why we just haven't been able to unlock it in our own minds yet because we haven't been able to read and write it out yet. But no matter what, read and, and, and write to test your thinking. Why a formal paper? Use my slides too. Like I just threw this together and I just, like I said, I, I pulled from this book and I just put down things that I felt like were going to uplift uh, formerly incarcerated and system impacted students and help them see the power of writing. And, and I threw it down real quick. So 
Um, this one's kind of a long one, and I'll just throw out some of it because I don't want to bore you guys uh, reading all this stuff. But even when they agree that writing is an important part of learning, thinking, and understanding, st some still wonder why they can, can't write up their research in their own way. Why they have to satisfy demands imposed by a community that they have not joined or even want to and conform to conventions they did nothing to create. Why should I adopt language and forms that are not mine? Aren't you just trying to turn me into an academic like yourself? If I write as you expect me to, I risk losing my identity. Such concerns are legitimate. Most teachers wish students would raise them more often, but it would be a feeble education that did not change you at all. And the deeper your education, the more you, it will change the you that you are that you are want to be. That's why it is so important to choose carefully what you study and with whom. But it would be a mistake to think that learning to report sound research must threaten your true identity. It will change the way you think, but only by giving you more ways of thinking. You will be different by being freer to choose whom you want to be and what you want to do with your life. But the most important reason for learning to write in ways readers expect is that when you write for others, you demand more of yourself than when you write for yourself alone. By the time you fix your ideas in writing, they are so familiar to you that you need help to see them not for what you want them to be, but for what they really are. You will understand your own work better than you try to anticipate your readers inevitable and critical questions. How have you evaluated your evidence? Why do you think it's relevant? What idea have you considered but rejected? All in researches, including us, can recall moments when writing to meet their readers' expectations, they found a flaw or a blunder in their thinking or even discovered a new insight that escaped them in a first draft written for themselves. You can do that only once you imagine that, that and then meet the needs and expectations of informed and careful readers. When you do that, you create what we call a rhetorical community of shared values. You might think, okay, I'll write for readers, but why not in my own way? The traditional forms that readers expect are more than just empty vessels into which you must pour your ideas. They also help writers think and communicate in ways they might not otherwise, and they embody the shared values of a research community. Whatever community you join, you'll be expected to show that you understand its practices by presenting your research in the standard forms or genres that a community uses to represent what it knows and how it knows. The various genres of research-based writing, the research paper, the scholarly article, the research report, the conference paper, the legal brief, and a great many others have evolved to meet the needs of the communities that use them. Relatively stable, they allow both newcomers and longtime members of a community to come together through shared practices and expectations. Once you know the understand, but as different as research communities are, what counts as good work is the same, whether it's the academic world or the world of government, commerce, or technology. If you learn to do research well now, you'll gain an immense advantage in the kind of research you will do later, no matter where you do it. Excuse me, I went on and on on that one, but that one's imperative. It's important to understand and learn the academic research writing styles of, uh, you know, uh, each one is different. Um, you know, uh, uh, and learn how to cite everything. Citation is important. Um, but one thing that I want to pull from this right here um, is it's important to write and, and follow the standards that are out there. Um, follow the academic standards that, that they call for because that's the only way you're going to uh, reach out to uh, the readers who are going to look at your research and look at the solutions that you're putting forth. So that, that was a breakdown of that one right there. Writing is thinking. 
Writing up your research is finally thinking with and for your readers. When you write for others, you disentangle your ideas from your memories and wishes so that you and others can explore, expand, combine, and understand them more fully. Thinking for others is more careful, more sustained, more insightful, in short, more thoughtful than just about any other kind of thinking. You can, of course, take the easy way, do just enough to satisfy your teacher. This book that, I, that I'm pulling this from is The Craft of Research. And uh, I'm gonna open up the chat in a minute. Let me see real quick. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, open it up for questions and like kind of break for some questions and kind of like engage everyone real quick in their ideas and, and just uh, anything that you have, please chime in on it. And, uh, and I'll also um, send, if you want this book, um, I'll send it to you. I sent it to the last uh, week's cohort of folks that came in and joined us. It's a very powerful book. Um, I'm still learning this stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm still learning how to do this stuff. So um, I, I, want, I want to get it out to everyone in the community because we need more researchers. We need more researchers from our communities. Um, so I want everyone to take this to their community and teach their community how to do research, how to write policy, how to write, uh, uh, academic, uh, research papers. And so I'll get it out. Um, so let's see here. I'm going to open it up right now to, to see here. Let me see. So the, the chat's open right now, too. And if you have questions in there, please put it in there. Put your email in there if you want that book, too. Um, if you want this, the curriculum vitae, um, like I said, uh, the curriculum vitae is, is super important for scholarships and all that stuff. So definitely chime into the chat. It's open now. So All right. So the next one, let me see here. So this is the conclusion. We hope this workshop has opened up your mind to the power of research and writing. We encourage you to write every day for the next week. And at the start of our next class, we will all share our favorite writing from the week. So that's our uh, workshop for today. Um, let me see the at real quick. Um, here, let me, uh, let me do that real quick. Let me open it up. Yeah. Uh, let me open it up so that anyone can unmute themselves now. All right, cool. You guys are, if you have questions, chime in. Good to see everyone. Good to see you, Oscar. I see a, a bunch of new faces in here too. So I have a comment. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Sabrina. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Sorry, I'm a little bit late. Um, but just kind of piggybacking off of what Flacco said, you know, I feel like this is really critical um, to examine, you know, research in our, in a bid to like decolonize academia. You know, I feel like if we're really to decolonize academia and create space for like BIPOC and marginalized communities, we need to be really efficient at writing and, and you know, policy crafting and everything that basically Blocko has been talking about. So thank you for putting this on. I really appreciate, you know, you doing this all for us. It's so critical if we're really going to, you know, make a name for our communities in such a predominantly white elitist institution. So thank you, Flacco. Most definitely. And, and you're so on point. We have to come together and it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm not getting paid for any of this. I can care less about money. It's about uplifting our communities. You know, money comes, money goes, legacies live forever, you know? And so uh, this, we can't just come to these institutions, learn this stuff, and then just keep it inside. We got to go out to our people and we got to share it with them. And we got to just give it away to them and let them know like, hey, look, like this is, this is, right. this is why we write. Um, this is important, you know? Um, and, 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 and we can't, uh, we can't uh, sit around and, and wait for people to do it for us because you can see what they've done. They've led, led us to be incarcerated. They've, you know, led us to, to, uh, uh, to be addicted to drugs. They've led us 
to thinking that uh, all we deserve is being drug dealers in our communities. You know what I'm saying? They've led us to to engage and participate in capitalism and and be all about capitalism and and be against each other and compete for capital. Like we gotta unwrite this shit. We got a whole bunch of stuff that's been written up against us to divide and conquer us. And so now it's up to us to come together and take this shit and run with it and share it with our communities and give it to our communities. Awesome, is there anybody else that has any more questions? Uh, if you want that book, please uh, put your email in there too. All right. Lockwell, I just had a comment or maybe a question. Um, I was wondering if there's a Google Drive for um, the org. Because maybe if there's a Google Drive and we all have access to the Google Drive, you could just drop all your resources in there for us. So you don't have to email us individually. I don't know if that would be easier for you. Yeah, um, yeah, we got we we got one set up now. So uh, oh, gotcha. Yeah, definitely. Uh, um, also, uh, uh, I was supposed to do that. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Gilbert told me to help with the folders. Did you guys? Yeah, no, he, he's got it. Yeah, yeah. He's, I just he's remembered. It. Right. No, he's got it. So, so yeah, okay. if we're going to send all that out too, so okay. there'll be so much awesome. stuff in there. So, awesome. Sorry about that, guys. I spaced out, but awesome. Thank you for taking care about that. Taking care nah, of that. You're, you're good. All right. Now, well, that, that sums up uh, the writing workshop for today. Um, if y'all have uh, any more things that you would like to add to it, um, I'll also uh, forward the video as well. Um, for those who missed the beginning of the class too, um, you could check out the, the video as well. And that's it for today. Um, thank you for taking the time out your day to come through and, and get this you know necessary understanding of the power of writing. And please take it back to your communities and share it. Thank you, Flacco. All right, everyone, take care. Thank you. Bye -bye. Stay safe.